Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Reptile and Amphibian Days. My name is Hugo, and I'm an educator at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. The talk for this morning, Solving Salamander Mysteries with DNA. But before we start, I have a question for you. What is the difference between salamanders and lizards? They look very similar, don't they? So write your answer on the chat. And if you have attended any of our previous programs, you should know the answer at this point. Um, all those presentations, if you, if you have missed it, uh, they are available on our museum uh, YouTube channel. And while we're waiting for those answers, remember that during the presentation, if you need to use the closed captions, you can click on the CC button or follow the link that we are going to drop on the chat. Um, and of course, if you have any questions for a presenter, we want to hear them, so write them down on the chat and we will ask our expert. So let me see if we have any answers about what is the difference between salamanders and lizards. Maybe it's the way that they eat, the way that they reproduce, the way that they look like. So any clues? Because if I think about them, they have same time of skin or maybe not. Maybe the way that they breathe. Hmm. Right now, I don't see anybody writing answers. So that means that they are thinking about it. I thought that that was an easy question, but apparently it's not. So this is a mystery. And to solve that mystery, oh yeah, I'm starting just to get question, uh, answers now. Salamanders breathe from their skin. Salamanders are slimy. Yeah, those are really good questions, but we're going to ask our expert. So let me introduce the expert for today. If you have attended any of our presentations about salamanders, you probably have seen some of his amazing pictures and heard about him. Exactly. We're talking about Dr. Todd Pearson. Dr. Todd Pearson is an assistant professor at Kennesaw State University. In his lab, students conduct field research and use genetic techniques to better understand the ecology and evolution of Appalachian salamanders. And when he's not doing research, because we know that he's very busy right now, Todd enjoys photographing these salamanders and the beautiful landscapes in which they live. So good morning, Todd, and thank you for being with us today. How are you? Great, thanks for the nice introduction, Hugo. I'm happy to be here. Great, so I can't wait to see what you have prepared for us today. So take it away. Wonderful, okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, well, thank you all for joining us today and thanks to the museum for having me here. I'm always happy to talk about salamanders. As Hugo said, um, the research that we do in my lab is very focused on Appalachian salamanders. Um, for better or for worse, it's just a bug stuck in my mind that I want to know more about how they work. And as I'll describe in this presentation, many of the things we want to know are hard to answer except for using genetic methods. So we'll talk just a bit about um, various salamanders today and the things we find interesting and how we use DNA to answer some of these mysteries. So many of you are familiar with these landscapes. These are places you can find in Western North Carolina or across the Southern Appalachians. These are moist, foggy forests, um, such as the Great Smoky Mountains and these beautiful bubbling brooks. And in these habitats, you can find just a tremendous diversity of salamanders. This is one of the reasons that we study this group. And you, if you attended any other presentations, you've surely heard this already, which is that salamanders are unique in many ways among other animals, but in one way it's because unlike most animals that are most diverse in tropical areas near the equator, salamanders are most diverse in temperate regions. And that's really driven, as you can see in this map, by salamander diversity in Southern Appalachia. You can see that bright red hot spot of salamander diversity approximately where many of you are located today. You can see there's also a great deal of diversity in the Pacific Northwest. And if you look real close, you can see there's actually a tremendous amount of diversity in Mexico and South in Central America. But most of what I'll talk about today is, is from here in the Eastern United States, especially in the Appalachian Mountains. 
So I thought first I'd just introduce you to some of the salamanders and their beautiful forms that, um, that we study and tell you a little bit about their natural history, some of which I'm sure you know already, just to set the stage. So some of these salamanders belong to the mole salamander family, like this beautiful spotted salamander here. They spend the large majority of their lives underground, um, living lives that we really don't know much about before they come out in just by the hundreds or thousands um, in this explosive breeding events in the winter or spring rains. So this is a spotted salamander entering a breeding wetland in East Tennessee. These salamanders also include the newts. Um, we don't have a great diversity of these here, but we have one very ubiquitous species, the Eastern newt. And they're unique because they have, they're unique for a couple of reasons. One is that they have a very um, interesting, what we call a triphasic life cycle. So they have an aquatic egg and juvenile larval phase. And then they have this terrestrial adolescent phase that we call the EFT. It's a great crossword puzzle clue. You can see one of those Fs right here. They have granular skin like a toad because they spend their time on land and out in the open. And they have bright red skin because they're very toxic. Um, they could kill a would-be predator if it tried to eat them. And then they move back into the water and have an aquatic stage as an adult. It's a life cycle that's very unique to this group of salamanders. One of the most famous salamanders you can find in North Carolina and other parts of the Eastern United States is the hellbender. This is our giant salamander. These grow to a couple feet long and they're fully aquatic, um, living in medium to large sized streams. They are also commonly called the snot otter or old lasagna size. They have a lot of great colloquial names. Um, and they're, it's a, not, like many of these salamanders, it's one that you're unlikely to ever see unless you're just lucky and happen across one. This is our, our giant salamander. But much of the diversity and much of what I'll talk about today comes from just a single salamander family, and that's the lungless salamanders or plethodonid salamanders. Many of these are kind of nondescript um, and brown in color and difficult to identify in a way that we'll talk about later. Um, but one key feature you can use to identify these lungless salamanders is this is called the nasolabial groove. I think you can see my cursor. This is this little groove that runs from the nostril to the tip of the snout there. That's a good way to identify them. This one's the seal salamander, one of the dusky salamanders. And here is perhaps the largest of these dusky salamanders, the black-bellied salamander. It's a very aquatic one. And again, you can still see its nasolabial groove right there. But not all of these lungless salamanders or plethodonid salamanders are nondescript and brown. Um, here's a very brightly colored, beautiful one, the spring salamander, which is common in, in many streams in the region. Um, these salamanders, as you might guess, much like that newt, they have bright skin, presumably because they are quite toxic, although we know much less about their toxins. The salamander is famous for another reason, and that's its diet. A large part of their diet is other salamanders. So any biologist who's um, carelessly put this together in a container with another salamander has maybe learned the hard way that they really like to eat other small salamanders. Another very bright and closely related species is the red salamander. Perhaps y'all have seen this one on a rainy night walking around. Pictured here on the top is a female and the bottom is a male um, found together. And they again have bright skin and bright patterns that is indicative of toxic skin secretions. Although again, we don't know that much about this species. Here's one of the most famous salamanders from Southern Appalachia, the most famous salamanders in the world probably, and that's the Jordan salamander or red-cheeked salamander. This one is found almost only within the boundaries of Great Smoky Mountains National Park at high elevations. And this is in, a, in the group called the woodland salamanders. They spend their whole lives um, in terrestrial habitats. And you might be sensing a theme here. The bright colored cheeks that this salamander has are again indicative of toxic skin secretions. And this one is perhaps less dangerous than those other species, but it, it is at least distasteful to predators. And those red cheeks serve as a warning that you know it's not worth the predator's time to try to eat this guy. But there are some tricky salamanders that live in the same area. This is the imitator salamander. It's another one of those dusky salamander species. And it likewise has red cheeks and it lives in the same habitats as those red cheek salamanders. In fact, I found this one just a few feet away from that last salamander. And 
although it has bright orange or red cheeks, this salamander is not distasteful, is not toxic. It would make a great food item for a, a would-be salamander predator, but it's counting on fooling them with these red cheeks, pretending that it's one of these red cheeked salamanders. And this is mimicry, and we see this across many species of animals, um, including these salamanders here. So I hope that brief introduction convinced you at least that salamanders are beautiful. And this is the first thing that drew me to them. They just come in so many shapes and colors and in many different forms, but they're also really interesting. You just learned a little bit about their natural history. And I suspect that many of you have watched other presentations this week where you've learned other interesting bits about salamanders. And I like to sum that up by this um, quote by the author, Bill Bryson, who says that salamanders are interesting and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I haven't had many people try to tell me otherwise, but now you're equipped with some of the facts that you can use to argue against them if they do. So before we proceed and I tell you about the next bit of this presentation, I thought I'd just check in with Hugo and see if there's any questions. I should encourage y'all, I'm happy to be interrupted anytime. So if you have questions, please enter them in the chat. And I'll answer them whenever. Sure, we have some questions on the chat. So Katrina wants to know, how are hell vendors true amphibians if they are fully aquatic? That's a good question. Yeah, so the, the, um, the question is whether, you know, the name amphibian suggests something about two or both. And that's because many amphibians have this, what we call a biphasic life cycle where they have, they live in both the water and the land. Sometimes that's the same, you know, within the same day that the animal can crawl from the water to the land. Sometimes it's because they have separate life cycles in the water and the land. That's not true of all amphibians. It's not true of all salamanders. And so we define amphibian through more of like an evolutionary definition. It's defined by the descendants of a common ancestor way back in time. So all frogs, toads, salamanders, and Sicilians are amphibians by that definition, but not all of them have that stereotypical life cycle. In fact, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Hellbenders are not the only ones that are fully aquatic. And then the she wants to know what is the purpose of these pots? So that we have seen some, some salamanders with, with these pots. What is that purpose? That's a great question too. I think the honest answer is we don't know the purpose of the spots in a lot of the species. Um, you can imagine that if they're brightly colored, they might likewise be serving as a warning about their toxicity. But in, for example, that, that um, spotted salamander, the one with the yellow spots, I don't think we know exactly the function of those spots. Great question. Okay, thank you. Great, all right, I'm gonna, hopefully give you a little bit more in information about why, not just among those of us who have already been persuaded that salamanders are great, why they're interesting, but even among folks who don't care too much about biology in general, why salamanders are important for, um, for research and other purposes. Okay, one of those reasons why people, biologists who don't even study salamanders know something about them is they're famous for their giant genomes. Right? Your genome is just all of the DNA that's in your cell. It's all of the DNA that makes you who you are. And the, you've learned something about the human genome. We first sequenced them you know, a couple decades ago. Um, you can do commercial services to sequence part of your genome through places like 23andMe today. And the human genome is pretty big in size. And even though that salamanders are much smaller than humans in body size, their genomes are much larger. So for example, this mud puppy pictured here, which is in the group of salamanders called water dogs, has a genome that's something like 30 times larger than the human genome. And that's on the extreme end, but most salamanders have a genome that's several times at least larger than the human genome. And so that's one puzzle. They have, they have bigger genomes than almost any other animal. That's one reason that we find them interesting and worth studying. Another reason that I've hinted at already is that many salamanders, most salamanders in fact, have no lungs. When they live in the water and they're the aquatic juvenile phase, Many of them breathe through gills that stick out of the side of their head, like you saw in that mud puppy. But many other species that live on land and don't have those gills breathe entirely through their skin. It's almost as if you know, your lung surface that you exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide through, they do that same thing, but just on their general skin surface. And so for that reason, they need to keep their skin moist and cool. And this is why they live in some of the habitats that we associate them with. So pictured here is an Akoe salamander, which is one of these species that has um, no lungs. Another reason that among biologists in general, salamanders are very famous 
is that they have incredible ability to regenerate almost anything from their body. So you, you've probably heard about how a lizard, they can drop their tail and regenerate it to some degree. Well, salamanders are just much better at that than lizards are. They're much better at that than basically any other animal. And scientists first discovered this and noted it with their ability to regenerate their tails and their legs. And it was thought at one point that this just must mean that they're constantly getting their legs and tails broken off or bitten off by a predator. You can see an example here in this black-bellied salamander. On the right is a normal limb. And on the left, it's, for some reason, it's lost a leg, maybe a crayfish or another salamander or some other unfortunate event. But it's regenerating its entire limb. You can see that it's kind of small right now. It's got little stubby fingers. But before long, a couple months longer, it'll have a, a new fully functional foot as good as new. And as scientists have looked more into this, it's not just legs and tails they can regenerate. If you cut off a part of their heart, they can regenerate it. They can regenerate brain tissue. They can regenerate almost any other tissue from their body in a way that seems impossible for most other animals. And we still don't exactly know how they do this. It's an active field of research. You can imagine there's many reasons we might want to know to understand our own bodies, for example. One of the reasons I love salamanders the most is they have really great and diverse life histories or their life cycles. This gets at that question we had just a minute ago. We think of amphibians, think of a stereotypical frog where it lays its eggs in the water, it has a tadpole, and then it metamorphoses into a terrestrial frog. So it has both an aquatic and a terrestrial phase. And some salamanders do that. So pictured here are eggs from a two-line salamander. These are hatching right now in North Carolina. And so you might be lucky and see these under a rock. And inside each egg, you can see the little embryo developing. And those will hatch out into a larva like this, also a two-line salamander, that spends the first year or three years of its life in the water. And you can see it has these big, bushy, feathery gills that it uses to breathe in the water. It has a paddle-shaped tail that um, propels it through the water. It's just very well adapted for life aquatic. But a year or a couple years later, it starts to undergo a radical change, much like a tadpole to a frog, and it changes the entire way that it feeds, it changes the shape of its tail, it absorbs those gills, it changes color, and it turns into, it metamorphoses into a terrestrial adult. So this is not that different than what you might think of a, a typical frog doing. This is partially where they get that name amphibian from. But not all salamanders do that. In fact, a huge percentage, maybe the majority of salamanders don't do that. Many species lay their eggs on land, such as the seepage salamander pictured here, Here's a, they, they also make great mothers for the most part. They, many salamanders guard their eggs. So here's a seepage salamander guarding her eggs. They, their ancestors had this same life cycle or they metamorphose, but they undergo that entire life cycle within their egg. And so by the time they hatch, they're these little miniature versions of the adults. They have no gills, they have no aquatic life stage, and they pop out of the egg ready to go and live on land. This is an incredible adaptation that's happened multiple times in salamanders and has allowed them to colonize habitats far from water. So you can be on a mountaintop where the nearest stream is a mile away and still find salamanders everywhere. That's because those salamanders don't have any aquatic stage. The flip side is that like the hellbender that we mentioned earlier, some species never leave the water. They never metamorphose. They never um, have any reason to leak. And so one example, we see this in a variety of different habitats and scenarios. One common one is species that colonize underground habitats. Pictured here is a cave salamander, um, very closely related to that spring salamander we talked about earlier. And this is one a species that lives in caves permanently. They, they're, the adults lay the eggs in water. They have an aquatic larval stage, but they never leave the water. They retain these gills into adulthood. This is an adult picture here. So even though it looks like one of those juvenile stages, this one is a fully mature adult never leaves the water. So they, they're kind of on all ends of this spectrum of aquatic to terrestrial life. Um, before I go to the next slide, I thought I'd give Hugo another chance to chime in with some questions if any have come in. Sure, we have some questions on the chat. So uh, for example, Mark wants to know, if there's any evolutionary reason for most salamanders having five toes on back feet, but four toes on front feet? That's a great question. And to be honest, I don't know that I know the answer. Um, 
I'll tell you what I, what I can speak to is that one phenomenon we see is that many salamanders that are the smallest species. So they're, you know, like those seepage salamanders only an inch long or something. Um, and some of those species, they've lost one of the toes off the back of the foot. So they only develop four toes. So that's some suggestion to us that the, the tiny size of these salamanders is a limitation in developing those toes. Maybe more toes would just get in the way or something. And so we see some variation in salamanders in the number of toes. Um, there are other famous examples. There's this group of salamanders, perhaps you all have seen the amphiumas, which have either one toe, two toes, or three toes. And it kind of just looks like a vestigial limb, we call it. Like it, it barely looks like a, a leg at all that they have. And so hopefully that somewhat answers your question. But the general plan, which you're right about, that most have four toes in the front and five in the back. I don't, I don't know the reason for that. And um, mm -mm -mm. so Megan wants to know what is the main predator of salamanders? Because you were talking about the some salamanders eat another salamanders, but what is the main predator? Yeah, great question. Um, they'll, so the species that are not very toxic, they'll be eaten by a wide variety of predators, snakes, birds, and some Appalachian ecosystems, shrews are a major predator of salamanders. You imagine that they, both of those um, groups of animals spend a lot of time underground. So they encounter each other in places that we can never observe. Um, but for many species, we don't really know what their natural predators are. It's not something that we can easily see. But yeah, I'd say birds, snakes, shrews, other salamanders, um, the aquatic larvae are probably great food for just about anything, fish, crayfish, etc. And we have another question from Katrina that she wants to know what are the appendages near the front feet on the cave salamanders? Good question. Those are um, sticking out here are gills. So those, each one of those is called a gill rachis and it, from it come these little feathery um, parts of the gills. So this just helps them get even more oxygen out of the water than they can get just through their skin. And so many species, when they're at the juvenile stage, they have these external gills. And when they metamorphose, they absorb those because they're not useful on land. But the species like this cave salamander that stay in the water their whole life, they often mean they keep those gills. And the last question for now is going to be, uh, you said that they regenerate their, their tail or their legs. How many times can they do that? I bet, I bet that answer is known, but I don't know it. To the best of my knowledge, there's not a limit, although it, it's not, you know, it doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes them some months to regenerate. And so it's still a costly um, event for a salamander if it loses a leg or a tail, for example. It's not without its downsides. So I, I, I think they can do it more than once in the same limb, for example. That's a great question. I should look that up afterwards. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Hugo. So you might notice by now in the presentation, I have not uh, mentioned DNA at all, but we're about to get to that part. So one, one reason that our lab studies salamanders, we find them interesting, is that not only can studying the salamanders tell us something about them and their evolutionary history and how we came to have so many species that we have today, but they tell us something about the landscape where they live. And one reason that's true, it's true for all organisms to some extent, salamanders are great models for this because they don't move very far. Any given salamander might only move some meters in its life. And so you can imagine that natural barriers, like a big river for species that don't go in the water, or a tall mountain range for species that live in the valleys. These natural barriers can um, cause a divide between species, could lead to there being one species on one side of the river and one on the other. And so by tracking sort of the evolutionary history of salamander and figuring out their relationships to each other, we can learn something not just about them, but about the way that the mountains have grown and been eroded, or the way that rivers have changed course through time. Here's a great quote that I think summarizes this. Um, by a famous biologist, George Byers, who was not a herpetologist and studied primarily insects, but the principle applies the same. And so he said that there were no eyewitnesses to the evolutionary changes or the geographical movements hypothesized here in the book he was writing. But it's nonetheless enjoyable and perhaps even somehow intellectually worthwhile to think about these things and make inferences. And this is what we try to do with DNA. There were no humans around watching these salamanders evolve in the last couple hundred million years. And we didn't directly witness the growth of mountains and their erosion, or the changes in the ecosystems that were found on those mountains. 
but we can look inside the genomes of these salamanders and learn a little bit about both of these things. And I think George uh, undersold this a little bit. I think it's definitely intellectually worthwhile because it tells us about how the world came to be. And one way we can do this, as I mentioned, is with DNA. And so um, my favorite thing to do is to go run around on a rainy night and watch salamanders do interesting things in the forest. But there's limitations to what we can learn from those direct observations. And so often what we do, students and I in my lab, we take a small piece of the salamander's tail, for example, and it doesn't harm them much at all. And we can get DNA from it, bring it back to the lab. We end up, I think y'all can see my video. Okay, here's a little tube with salamander DNA in it. And from that little drop of water in a tube, we can learn a lot of things from how they're related to each other to when they might have diverged from each other, how the, the previous climates they lived in might have changed, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give you some examples of how we do this. Here's just a picture from the lab. So the being a salamander biologist is not always running around in those beautiful Appalachian landscapes. It's sometimes long hours of moving small volumes of liquid around like this. So here's a great example of how we need to use DNA to understand how salamanders are related to each other and what's what. Maybe nothing exemplifies this better than the dusky salamanders, the genus Desmonathus we talked about earlier. These are notorious for, even though there's tremendous diversity here, there's many dozens of species, they all kind of look the same. This is a phenomenon called morphological conservatism, meaning that even though millions of years have passed since these salamanders last shared a common ancestor, if you trace back their family trees, they wouldn't intersect for many, many, many millions of years. They still kind of look the same. But these are three different species. Picture on the left here is the seal salamander. The bottom is a spotted dusky salamander and the top is a black-bellied salamander. And if you look very close, you can notice some differences. Their patterns are a little bit not quite the same. Um, their tail shapes are different. This species here, the black-bellied salamander is the most aquatic and it has the most paddle-shaped tail. Whereas this one on the bottom is the most terrestrial and it has the most rounded tail. These characters can often be very misleading because more than one species can have a similar tail shape or a similar pattern. And we really can't understand how many species of dusky salamanders there are or which ones live where or how they're related to each other without looking at their DNA. And so this is one group of salamanders where many scientists currently study uh, this group to better figure out you know, what's what. We can't even give them an appropriate name without looking at their DNA. One thing that comes out of these kinds of studies of using a little bit of their DNA to understand what they are is the description of new species of salamanders. You might think that all salamanders were discovered long ago, especially in a place like the Southern Appalachian Mountains where many hundreds of salamander biologists have worked for a long time, but we're still discovering and describing new species every year. So here are just a few examples. Here's one locally in North Carolina that maybe y'all have heard about already. Just in the last couple of years, this salamander was described as a species new to science, the hickory nut gorge green salamander. As the name suggests, it's found only in the hickory nut gorge near Asheville, North Carolina. And this species looks quite a lot like other green salamanders that are found throughout Appalachia. And it wasn't until scientists looked at parts of its DNA, its giant genome, and could figure out that it's actually quite distinct, even though they look the same there. They haven't interbred for a long, long time. So this is one great example from locally here in North Carolina. Here's another species that was just described new to science in the last few years. Um, this is the yellow spotted woodland salamander. And although its name suggests it has a unique morphological character, it has these yellow spots. Um, it's a generous description. They're kind of more of beige spots in this one. And so it was long suspected to be something interesting. It wasn't again until scientists use DNA to understand just how different it was from its closest relatives. This one is found um, mostly in shale rock outcrops near the Cumberland Mountains, sort of in coal country of Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee. And so this also goes to show such like with the hickory nut gorge green salamander and this yellow spotted woodland salamander, many times these species are tied to very specific geographic regions. And, even when we discover a new species, we learn something new about that region. We learn something new about the hickory nut gorge being very distinct. So we're learning both about the salamanders and the landscape by looking at their DNA. Here's another recent example. 
This is one of these water dogs. This one's called the Apalachicola water dog. This is a fully aquatic species with a giant, giant genome. And it was once recognized as a single, very widespread species across the Gulf coastal plain. And again, only until scientists looked at the DNA of these salamanders, they realized these things are actually quite different from each other. And this one was described just from the Apalachicola River and its associated drainages in the last couple of years. I'll give you one example far from North Carolina, far from where I come to you from today in Atlanta. And that's this, the Sierra de Shukineb hidden salamander. This is a tropical salamander. Um, this one lives in Guatemala. It's found in high elevation cloud forests. And it was also just described in recent years. And it, similarly, it looks kind of like other salamanders in this genus called Cryptotriton, which is what that means, hidden salamander. Um, and it wasn't until scientists looked at their DNA, they recognized how unique it was. This is a female pictured here, and they've got these great big nostrils you can see in the picture, presumably because for a tiny salamander to find each other in the canopies of the cloud forest, they've got to inhale a lot of air to smell it. So this is another good example. And these are but a handful of examples of something that happens several times a year. We're constantly discovering these new species of salamanders. And so that's one great use of DNA is to, when things look the same, figure out that they're actually different and describe new species to science. I'm going to give you one more example, and then I'll take some more questions from y'all. Um, this example is exemplified by another great quote. If you can't tell, I like, I like finding these quotes that are relevant here. This one's by another author um, from Tennessee, David Haskell. And he says, the tree of life is a poor metaphor. The deepest parts of our genealogies resemble networks or deltas with much interweaving and cross flow. And what David's describing here is that we often represent relationships between species with a tree. You might have seen the famous drawing that Darwin made to show his idea of evolution by natural selection, of how species are related to each other. And that is, we have one common ancestor and it splits into two species. And those species might split each of them into two more species. So you're constantly going from a smaller number of species to more. That's how life diversifies. And that's true. And it's a pretty good metaphor, but it misses some complexities here. And that's because sometimes species split apart, but then they come back together. They hybridize with each other. And this is a phenomenon that we first maybe discovered the relevance of in recent years in our own genomes. Most of us listening to this call have a part of our genome that if you trace back your family tree far enough, does not just come from ancient humans, but comes from Neanderthals. That's because even though ancient humans and Neanderthals diverged, they came back together. And our genomes are kind of a composite of these two um, ancestors. And we thought for a while, well, that's pretty cool. Humans have this unique part of their history. But the more we began to look at other organisms, we found out this is actually the rule rather than the exception. Most organisms that we examine, they have some of this hybridization going on in their past. And much like how the previous examples I told you about can tell us something about the landscape in which these salamanders evolved, finding evidence that they have hybridized in the past can also tell us something about how the landscape has changed. So let me give you one example here. This is a group of salamanders I study. These are the two-lined salamanders. And there you, a general pattern you observe is that maybe in every river drainage, you find a different species or different population of these salamanders. Maybe there's one group that's in the Apalachicola River, another in the Mobile drainage, another in the Tennessee River, etc. But we know, we're pretty sure, that not that long ago in evolutionary time, these rivers looked very different than they do today. Here on the right is a picture of what they were hypothesized to look like maybe 10 million years ago. 10 million years ago, there were still two lined salamanders around. And so as these rivers have shifted course, as one river steals water from another, as one river maybe erodes into the mountain and captures a bigger area, the salamanders, the environments in which they're evolving also change. And maybe two species that lived in different rivers are brought back together and have a chance to hybridize. And so let's bring this example home to uh, something tangible. Here are two two line salamanders that coexist in some streams in North Carolina. This is a picture I took in Great Smoky Mountains National Park of a Blue Ridge two-line salamander on the left 
and a Junalusca salamander on the right. These are both species of two lion salamanders that probably once evolved in different river drainages. Today, they're found side by side. And today they don't hybridize. But buried in the genome of this Junalusca salamander is a small part that actually you can trace back its ancestry to this species, which means that at some point in time, they did hybridize. So evolution is very complicated, and this is something we could never learn except for looking at the DNA of these salamanders, learning exactly how they're related. So much like us with a bit of Neanderthal DNA in our genomes, this Junalusca salamander has a small part of its ancestry that traces back to a totally different species. This is not just true in two line salamanders, it's true in many organisms, many salamanders. Um, a great example is the slimy salamanders. They have many species described that all look kind of similar and might be divided by things like a mountain range or um, a big river. But sometimes those species come back together today and they might be hybridizing actively today. It's something that DNA can really help us understand. Uh, before I go on to this next example, I'll give Hugo a chance to feed me any more questions that have come in. Sure. I mean, I am obsessed now with all these salamanders because they are so similar, but at the same time, they're so different between them. That's right. So we have questions from the chat. So, for example, from Katrina, how many genes would the average salamander have? That's a great question. I... Uh... I don't know a number to tell you offhand, but I'll, I think I can answer the gist of your question, which is that they have giant genomes, not because they have more genes than you. They have these bits of their genome. Um, this happens in all organisms, but there are bits of your genome that can duplicate themselves and kind of proliferate throughout your genome. These are repetitive bits of DNA. There's a specific kind called a transposable element that from what we know so far seems to dominate salamander genomes. So it's actually some um, very similar bits of DNA that just makes a bunch of copies of itself and fills up their giant genomes. And so interspersed between all those repetitive bits are some of the same genes that you and I have. And so it's not that they have more genes, it's more that they have a bunch of this repetitive DNA. And it doesn't mean that DNA doesn't have a function. There might be a very good reason why their genomes are full of this repetitive stuff. And we're just beginning to understand that sort of thing. I hope that answered it well enough. Yeah. So then we have some questions about the diet of the salamanders. Yeah. So because we were talking before about the some salamanders eat another salamanders. So why do they eat each other? And if they are not eating each other, what is the main prey of a salamander? Great question. Most salamanders that I've talked to you about today eat a wide variety of invertebrates from worms to um, various arthropods, insects, uh, whatever they can kind of fit inside their mouth. Um, and some of the larger species like the hellbenders, they eat a lot of crayfish, maybe some fish. And so they're very opportunistic predators. And being an opportunistic predator, if you go out on a rainy night in some of these Appalachian streams, you can stand in one place and see dozens of salamanders. These are, as you might've heard in some previous presentations, these can be so abundant, it's amazing. I've been in the field before and been staring at one salamander and felt something on my toes and seen other salamanders crawling across my feet. That's just how abundant they can be. And so if you're an opportunistic predator and you're a big salamander, a great source of prey is other salamanders because they're so abundant. And so that's probably why those spring salamanders eat other salamanders. It's just, it's a readily abundant food source, but most of them are eating insects and, and other invertebrates. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when you were talking about the hickory nut uh, green salamander, I've seen on the picture that the back feet were split or was just the picture? Uh, I don't know. It might've just been the picture. I'm not sure exactly what it looked like. Okay, so we will see it later. So, um, and then if they are regrowing the parts, so Mark wants to know, are they regenerated limbs or of equal equality as the original? Uh, basically, yes, that's true. So what you might know about lizards, for example, when they regenerate their tails, it often looks kind of stubby and it's not full length. It might be a different color. And so it's not fully maybe functional in the same way. Salamanders regenerate tissues that are basically the same as, as the original. They'll, you might, that, that picture I showed you was a leg that was still in development. 
but come back in a couple of months and it might be indistinguishable from a, a original leg they were born with. So this is what's truly amazing about their regenerative abilities. It's unlike basically anything else we know in the animals. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, let me, after I just told y'all that DNA is great for looking at salamanders that look the same, but are actually different, I'm gonna give you an opposite example. That's that sometimes salamanders will look very different, but be maybe the same thing. So here's an example from my own research. And this is the question that I'm truly obsessed with understanding is that maybe 40 years ago, David Seaver, a salamander biologist, observed this phenomenon. These are two lion salamanders from the Appalachian Mountains. And in the same stream, some males would look like this one on the right here. They're often a little bit more brightly colored. They have these long things hanging from their nose, which kind of look like a mustache. We'll talk about those in a second. And this is what we stereotypically think that males of this species look like. But in the very same stream, you would find males that instead look like this one on the left. They don't have that mustache. They're a little bit bigger. And most important, they have this funny shaped head. It's much more like a triangle. You can see it's really swollen by the jaws here. And knowing what we know about salamanders, Dave thought very justifiably, this must be a case like these other things we've talked about where these are actually two different species living together. And although they look superficially similar, except for these traits, I bet DNA will tell us these are actually two different things. And it was long suspected that that was the case. Let me show you just a little, a few more details about these. Here's um, a close up of that first male that I showed you. These things hanging from his nose, we call them Siri, and they hang down from his nostrils. And we, we kind of know the function of those. They grow just during the breeding season and they help funnel water from the forest floor, like from this moss up into his nostrils. So these males run around looking for mates in the fall and they touch these Siri down to the forest floor and they can smell where other salamanders are. And our, our uh, research group has done some collaborative research to figure out what exactly is going on here. And before I show the next slide, I'll tell you that the other traits and the other salamanders also have a function. Here's that other kind of male. These, these males, they lack those, that mustache, but they've got these big jaws. And we know that that's from a muscle that grows during the breeding season again. And what we've learned from some behavioral studies, but importantly, through looking at their DNA, is that these two very different looking males are not different species. The two that you can find that look so different within the same stream could be brothers or cousins. They're the same species in the same population. They're just males that develop in two different ways. And that's because they reflect two very different strategies. That, let me go back for a second. This male we call the searching male, and it's because he runs around the forest looking for mates by touching these Siri, this mustache down to the ground and smelling around. This other kind of male has a very different strategy. He doesn't run around searching. We call these guarding males. And that's because they hang out in the stream or they'll eventually lay their eggs. And they use those jaws to fight other male two lion salamanders for their territory. Often in the breeding season, you can find them not only with these big jaws, but with these bite marks all over their body that look just exactly like a little salamander mouth. So we can tell they've been fighting each other with those jaws. So pictured here is one of these guarding males. You can see his great big jaws sticking out from his head with a female, with his mate and the eggs that they're guarding together. And so here's an example where in contrast to the past where salamanders that looked the same turned out to be very different when we looked at their DNA. Here's an example where they looked quite different based on what we learned from other salamanders, we suspected maybe they were different species. But actually this is diversity that exists within a species. And we weren't quite sure about that until we looked at their DNA. All right, I'm gonna move into the final example I'm gonna give you all about how we use DNA to solve these salamander mysteries. Now I've already told you, and perhaps you've heard in previous presentations, these salamanders can be super abundant. And this, just in this picture, there are surely thousands of salamanders. There are some studies that estimate in a single square meter of a stream like this, just one species, the two-line salamander, there might be as many as 80, 80 larvae in that one square meter of stream. And so think about this picture. That's one species. There might be 15 different species in this stream here. So there's just thousands and thousands of individuals. The challenge, though, is that they're really secretive. Some species in particular are just really hard to find. You could spend all day 
looking under every rock in the stream, walking around on a wet night when they're all active and still not see one of the species that we know lives there. And so as scientists, especially as conservation biologists, one task that we constantly have is figuring out where exactly salamanders live. We can't protect their habitats. We can't name them if we don't know where they live. And this is a, a constant challenge in especially some species of salamanders. And one technique we use taking advantage of DNA is environmental DNA. And this is a rather popular method now that I'm sure y'all have heard of. And we use it for a whole variety of organisms. And basically we um, were treating this stream like a crime scene, much like the police would if they're investigating a crime. And we're looking for DNA left behind by these salamanders to tell us that they've been there. And these techniques vary across different animals, different ecosystems, but here's how we do this. We go to these streams and we collect a couple of bottles of water. This is especially easy in beautiful mountain streams like this one where the water is crystal clear, but basically stick the bottle into the stream and collect a couple of liters of water. We then filter that water. So here we're pulling it through this um, filter here. And you can see that some sediment and other things, including DNA, gets stuck in this filter paper at the bottom. And so we've gone from a couple of liters of water to basically a little piece of paper that has within it DNA from every organism in that stream and a bunch of other things too. We then do a bunch of lab work to isolate the DNA just from the salamanders that we care about. And then we do some bioinformatic analyses or genetic analyses to figure out what exactly was there. And there's many different ways you can use these methods. I'll give you one example from our research of how it's been really beneficial. So here is perhaps my favorite salamander in the world, one that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, this is the patch-nosed salamander. And it is aptly named. You can see this little larva here has a bright yellow patch on its nose. And I will, I'll preempt this question and say, we have no idea why they have this bright yellow patch. I would love to know. This species is special because it was only discovered in 2009, um, or so maybe 2007, described in 2009. So it's been known to the world for less than 15 years. It's found only in a very tiny part of Georgia and neighboring South Carolina. And it is so distinct from any other salamander that we've ever seen that it was named to its own genus, Urspilerpes. It last shared an ancestor. If you track back its family tree, generation to generation to generation, the last time that family tree intersects with another salamander is 45 million years ago. Just the, the scale of how unique this find was is hard to describe. And so we wanted to know more about it. It's found in a tiny area, it's very unique, and anything that's found in such a small area probably has some conservation threats. And so our first challenge is to figure out where exactly it lives. And as you can see in this picture, this is an incredibly tiny salamander. This is a, a relatively young larva, but even the adults only get about an inch long at maximum size. And so there's already some challenges just finding tiny salamanders. You gotta have at least some good eyesight to see them. But they live in a really complex habitat too that's hard to search. So here is a classic patch nose salamander stream from Georgia. Stream is a very generous description of this habitat because at full high flow, which is what you're seeing in this picture, it is barely a trickle of water over rock. And the salamanders are found in the leaf litter on the side of these streams in little silt pools at the base of some of these rocks. And it's just challenging to, to crawl through these streams and find them. Um, not only is it challenging, but you do a little damage to the stream in the process. You gotta be crawling through there all day, digging through um, rocks and mud and stuff to look for the salamander. By the time you leave, it looks like some hogs have been through there. And obviously we don't wanna be damaging the habitat of these salamanders, but we gotta know where they live to, to protect them. And we originally started doing some surveys using traditional techniques. We look in the leaves, we flip rocks, we put out these what we call leaf litter bags, which are a standardized way of surveying for salamanders. And all these method methods worked really great for finding the other 10 species of salamander that live in the same stream. We find tons of black-bellied salamanders, and seal salamanders, and red salamanders, et cetera. But they were really lousy methods at finding the patch nose salamander. We calculated that using these leaf litter bags, we'd have to put 25 of them out in the stream and come back and check them after two weeks 70 times before, without finding one of these before we could be sure that it didn't live there. And that just was not a practical way of doing it. However, we learned that around the same time, these environmental DNA methods were coming out and we decided to give it a shot. 
And what we learned is that if we collect three bottles of water from the stream, which is a challenge in itself because there's barely any water trickling through, we collect three bottles of water, we bring it back to the lab, we analyze it and look for evidence of the salamander. With just three bottles of water, we can have a 99% chance of finding the salamander if it's there. Much less search effort, you don't have to disturb the stream and we can be very confident in our answer. And so we've taken this method and we've surveyed something like 150 new streams. And from those, we've discovered a handful of new places where we didn't know the salamander lived. And we've discovered not even the salamander itself, but its DNA. And just to be sure that we're not a little crazy here, we've gone back in a single search and worked hard and confirmed that the salamander lives at those sites by finding the actual animals. Pictured here are the adults of this salamander. Here's a male on the top and a female on the bottom. And so using just their DNA to start with, this environmental DNA, we've really maximized our effort to be able to figure out where this very rare salamander lives, expand the areas, and maybe in the future protect some places um, to ensure the, the preservation of the species. So just another example of how the DNA is, is really great in uncovering these mysteries. All right, that is the end of my presentation. Um, I hope I've convinced you that salamanders are interesting. And I've given you a little bit of detail about how we use DNA to uncover these mysteries. There are still so many salamander mysteries that we don't know the answer to. It's a great field to study. It's a great group of organisms to get obsessed with. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all have with the remainder of our time. Yeah, so, I mean, this is mind blowing. First of all, the pictures. I need to know how can you take those pictures? Because for me, I like, I like to take pictures. I go outside and I don't see anything. <laughs> this is the first thing. So how, how can you find these animals and take those pictures? So because I'm pretty sure that a lot of viewers, they want to know they have their cameras ready and said, okay, when we finish with the procedure, I'm going outside and take pictures. <laughs> It's uh, the short answer is it's they're not easy animals to photograph for a couple of reasons. One is just the technical aspect for the photography. They're very small. And so you often want to use a macro lens to get very close to them. And the challenge then is getting the lighting right so that um, their skin isn't too reflective and things like that. The other challenge is in being humane and ethical and photographing the salamander. Some of these photographs, I walked around on a rainy night with my camera in plastic bags and snap the photo just as I found them. But with many of them, I was doing research on the salamanders and when I caught them for other purposes, I quickly put them down on a leaf and took a photograph. And if you do that, you just have to make sure you do it in an ethical way, which is you keep the salamanders moist because they can dry out very quickly. You don't want to handle them in your bare skin because the salts and the oils from your hands can disturb them. You don't want to put them in the sign and you don't want to bother them more from, than a, a minute or so. And so all of those things conspire to make photographing salamanders very challenging. <laughs> Your experience is, is right, Hugo. So we have a question from Megan. She wants to know what is the rarest salamander? Oh, that's a great question. Well, there are some salamanders that we think have gone extinct in the last couple of decades. And so I guess on that level, they might be the rarest salamanders. Some of them might still be out there in very small numbers waiting to be rediscovered. Um, but I bet some of those qualify. There are other salamanders that live in a very restricted area, such as that patch nose salamander. There are others that live just on a single mountaintop or in a single um, oak forest in Guatemala or Mexico. And within those habitats, they might be very abundant, but because they live in such a tiny area, they are, you know, they're, we consider them rare still. And so I don't know if I have a single species as a good example, but those are all among the candidates for the rarest salamander probably. And we don't have much time, so I want to wrap up with this question for you. So we have learned how amazing and how important these animals are. So do you have any advice for all of viewers in how to protect them? Yeah, great question. Um, I, as with most organisms, I think the greatest threat to salamanders is habitat destruction. And so on a large scale, we want to support, you know, initiatives that preserve forests that they live in or other habitats that they live in, maintain environmental regulations that keep our streams clean. On a personal level, in your own backyard or property that you might own, leaving around downed trees and logs and rocks and things where they like to hide under is great. Um, another, another threat to salamanders and other amphibians, 
and other organisms, but especially amphibians, is disease. We've seen major die-offs and some extinctions, we think, because of a couple of fungal diseases that have spread around the world. And the really unfortunate part is that we can be the ones spreading those, scientists, hikers, anybody who's going out in nature. And so the important ways that you can prevent um, from spreading diseases is, first of all, never catch an animal and go release it somewhere where it doesn't belong. Never let your pets go into the wild. And if you're going to be hiking around in streams or looking for salamanders and things, it's great when you move between places. Maybe you're hiking in one place one day, another place another day to clean off your gear as much as you can. Brush the dirt off of your shoes. Um, let them dry out in the sun at the very least to kill any pathogens that could be on there. So those are some of the things you can do in your personal life that's probably good for salamander conservation. Yeah, so that is great. Um, so thank you, Todd, for being with us today. Um, this was a great presentation. So that we have learned a lot and we discovered new species that we even knew that, that they were there. And thank you everybody for attending this program, but remember that we have more coming up. So check out our website, naturalsciences.org and click on the Reptile and Amphibian Day uh, banner for more information. So if you are a member, thank you so much for being a friend of the museum because your support let us create programs and events like this one. And if you're not, maybe, this is a chance for you to join. And if you do it now during the Reptile and Amphibian Day, you can get a free Reptile and Amphibian Day t-shirt with the Marvel Salamander. Again, thank you Todd so, so much for this presentation and thank you everybody. And I hope to see you all in another presentation. Happy Friday, everybody. Thank you everyone.